Hello students, welcome to Baiju's IS. Welcome to this particular video series where we will be discussing some of the very important points that are being mentioned in the second volume of economic survey. Before I start with the discussion, here are some of the very important points. The second volume consists of 10 chapters. Out of this, the first chapter is basically the summary of all the chapters. Hence, in the first chapter, we will be taking up some of the very important concepts such as the concept of GDP, GVA, virtuous cycle of a growth which have been discussed and we will be analyzing these particular concepts. Second point, there are certain chapters related to social issues such as healthcare, such as education. Whenever I come across these particular concepts, I will give you relevant information that has been provided in this particular volume of economic survey. Third point, the remaining chapters are basically nothing but the macroeconomic indicators that you are supposed to know which will help you in writing the UPC problems as well as UPC means. Within these particular 10 chapters, there are certain very important chapters which are very important for you with respect to GS paper 3 as well as the economic concepts in the UPC prelims. A lot of information has been provided with respect to concept of gross capital formation, investment in the market, the role of central banker in controlling inflation, the issue with respect to onion prices in the market, what reforms have been taken by government of India to control inflation in the recent times, what reforms have been taken by government of India to promote exports, so on and so forth. These particular concepts are very very important. You will have to know these particular concepts in clarity. So whenever we come across these kind of concepts, I will give you sufficient amount of information which will help you in understanding these particular concepts. So with these particular pointers, let's begin the discussion of volume 2 of economic survey 2019-2020. The first chapter is based on the concept of a state of economy. As already mentioned, this particular chapter is basically a summary of all the remaining chapters in the economic survey. To begin with, one very important report has been discussed in this particular chapter. The report I am referring to is the World Economic Outlook which is published by IMF. A lot of information has been provided from this particular report. Now whenever I keep on quoting the names of the reports, please make a note of them for a simple reason. Usually in the UPSC prelims, there is a trend which has been practiced by UPSC wherein they are going to ask you the names of these particular reports which are published by various international organizations. One such very important report is World Economic Outlook. And in the volume 1 when we discussed, there was one chapter which basically discussed the concept of ease of doing business. And one report that I had mentioned during that particular discussion was ease of doing business report which is published annually by World Bank. Again, another very important report from the perspective of UPC prelims. So let's begin the discussion of the points which have been mentioned in the economic survey with respect to the World Economic Outlook report. This particular report which was recently published makes a note that global economy has grown by 2.9% for the year 2019 but for the year 2017 the growth rate was 3.8% and for 2018 the growth rate declined to 3.6%. So when you see the growth rates of the global market there is a slowdown in the international market. One, what are the reasons? And second, what is the impact on India? First, the reasons for this particular decline in the growth rate or the slowdown in the growth rate are one, there is an increased trend of protectionism which has been followed by various economies. The best example in this particular point will be the recent trade policies which are being followed by government of USA or the administration of USA. Once the new administration came to power, they have basically increased this kind of a trend of introducing trade protectionism. For example, they introduced the tariffs on steel and aluminium imports. Very recently, the administration of USA has withdrawn the GSP benefits that was given to Indian exports. And very recently, the USA has announced that India will be taken out of the list of developing countries and will be classified as a developed economy. So you can see that there is an increased protectionism or the trend of increased protectionism under which various types of tariffs, that is in simple terms, tariff barriers as well as non-tariff barriers are being imposed by various economies. The impact of these particular barriers is that the global trade will be affected. And when the global trade is affected, the global growth will also get affected. This is the first reason. 
Second reason, trade wars and the impact of the trade wars. US and China are the main two countries which are involved in the trade wars. The concept of a trade war is the trading partners will keep on imposing tariffs that is barriers on the exports from each other markets. And whenever these kind of barriers are imposed, as already mentioned, it will affect the global growth. But more importantly, please understand this. The present system is getting affected by this particular concept of a trade war because there is a concept of a global value chain system. That is a simple product to be manufactured. There are multiple countries or economies which are involved in this particular manufacturing phase. So whenever this particular product is manufactured in multiple countries and the final product is exported, let's say to USA and the USA imposes the tariffs on this particular import, the supply will get affected. And when the supply will get affected, all the countries which are involved in the GVC will also get affected. And when these particular countries will get affected, their contribution to the global growth will also get affected. Hence, there is a slowdown in the global market. This is the second reason. The third reason is the natural outcome of the first two. That is when this particular GVC will get disrupted, when the trade wars will have an impact not only on these two countries but on other trading partners also, when the trade protectionism will increase, this will lead to lower growth rate in developed economies. And when developed economies will register a lower growth rate, the global growth rate or the global economy will also get affected. So these are some of the reasons why the global economy has been experiencing a slowdown. This is the answer to the first question. Now I also asked a second question. What will be the impact of this particular issue of a slowdown in the global market on the Indian economy? That is more important for us. Please understand, Indian market is integrated with the global market. That is basically another concept of a globalization. We will discuss this. Under the idea of a globalization, the integration of the markets is going to increase. And when your integration to the international market increases, if anything happens in the international market, your economy will also experience the impact of this particular event. This in simple terms is referred to as a spillover effect. That is, if something happens in the global market, such as Brexit event, or such as US presidential elections, or such as a trade war, the impact of this will be felt on the Indian market also. That is the reason with the slowdown in the international market, there is also a slowdown in the domestic market. But again, having said so, you cannot simply say that whenever there is a slowdown in the international market, a guaranteed slowdown will be experienced by the domestic market. This cannot be true always for a simple reason. Whenever goods or services are produced, these particular goods or services can be exported to the international market which will contribute to GDP or can be sold in the domestic market also which will also contribute to GDP. But in the present context what has happened, there is a slowdown in the domestic market also, there is a slowdown in the international market also. Our exports have got stabilized in certain situations, so the exports have in fact have come down. As a result of this, there is also a contribution of this particular international slowdown or the global economic slowdown on the domestic slowdown. So these are some of the points which are mentioned in this particular report with respect to global economy. Now specifically to Indian economy, some of the very important points which have been mentioned are first, Indian economy is the fifth largest in the global market. That is the value of GDP has increased from 2.7 trillion dollars in the year 2017 to 2.9 trillion dollars expected to be in the year 2019. As a result of this, India has overtaken United Kingdom and has become the fifth largest economy in the international market. That is one very important point. Second, Indian economy in the last five years has grown at an average rate of a 7.5% and with an inflation rate of 4.5%. And since there is a stable rate of inflation and a very good rate of GDP growth rate, Indian economy is on its way to achieving a $5 trillion value of the economy. That is the second very important point. Now apart from this, there is also a discussion on concept of economic cycles. In case of economic cycle, we basically say there are four phases. One is called as a boom phase, second one is called as a slowdown phase, third one is called as a recession phase and the fourth one is called as a recovery phase. Again, I'll repeat it. Economic cycles will have four phases. One is a boom phase, then the slowdown, then the recession, then the recovery. Uh, every economy is expected to pass through these particular phases. 
in case of indian economy economic survey states that the phase will change from one to the next one that is from boom to slow down after every 13 quarters in the last couple of years as per this particular survey the change in the phase will happen after 13 quarters which has been provided in this particular graphical representation what is the meaning of this the simple meaning is we are in a slowdown phase now this particular slowdown phase will change to the next phase after 13 quarters this is the basic meaning of the concept of economic cycle and the inference which has been provided in the economic survey now apart from this the economic survey also mentions the first advanced estimates for the financial year 20 before I look into the numbers which are provided, one very important point to note here is the Indian economy has been experiencing a slowdown. Now some of you will have a doubt, what is the meaning of the term slowdown? Slowdown basically refers to the declining trend of a GDP growth rate. That is the GDP growth rate from the reference of time period has been declining. That is, let's say first quarter you will experience a GDP growth rate of 5%. Second quarter will experience a GDP growth rate of 4.5%. Third quarter will experience a GDP growth rate of 4.2%. This particular declining trend is basically referred to as a slowdown in the GDP growth rate. And Indian economy has been going through a phase of a slowdown. Various experts have said that this particular slowdown is because of a change in the economic cycle as well as certain structural factors. Now some of the reasons why there is a slowdown has been the industrial activity has been subdued in the recent times. The manufacturing activity has not been up to expected level. The investment or gross capital formation has not been very high. All the other sectors except let's say agriculture and allied sectors or public expenditures have been at a much lesser rate or in certain periods of time have been contracting. As a result of this, Indian economy is going through a slowdown phase. As per economic survey, the first advanced estimates basically state that the growth rate for the financial year 20 in real GDP is estimated to be around 5% and the nominal GDP is estimated to be around 7.5%. Now, what is the concept of a real GDP? What is the concept of the nominal GDP? And why these are important? Please understand, whenever I take the present market value of the goods and services and calculate GDP, this is referred to as a nominal GDP. That is, whenever GDP, gross or domestic product, is calculated, taking into consideration the current prices, it is called as a nominal GDP. And why nominal GDP is very important? Indian economy has been registering a nominal GDP growth rate of double digits in the last couple of years. But in the recent times, the nominal GDP has been less than 10%. The problem with respect to reduction in the nominal GDP is, one, the nominal GDP numbers are important to calculate the real GDP numbers. Now what is the real GDP? The market prices of goods and services will increase because of the inflation trend also. The impact of this particular inflation is taken out. And when we take out the impact of the inflation from the current market prices, we arrive at a concept called as a constant market prices. I'll repeat the point again. The current market prices are influenced or are having an impact of inflation. The impact of this particular inflation is taken out to arrive at a constant price. And when I calculate GDP, take into consideration the constant prices, that GDP is called as real GDP. Now, to calculate a real GDP, first and foremost, you require nominal GDP. First point. Second point, nominal GDP, if it is increasing, it also means the consumption of goods and services or sales of goods and services in the market is also increasing. And if the sales of goods and services are increasing, it means that the number of employment opportunities in the market is increasing. The per capita incomes of the economy are increasing. The tax collections in the form of, let's say, GST of the government is also increasing. The tax collection in the form of, let's say, income taxes of the government should also increase because the employment or per capita incomes are increasing. So basically, nominal GDP is important for all these particular parameters. In the recent times, the nominal GDP has fallen below 10% and various experts have raised concern with respect to this particular decline in the nominal GDP rates. Usually, you will come across a concept of a tax buoyancy, which is nothing but the response of the tax collection with respect to GDP. So, whenever the GDP growth rates are increasing, we also expect the tax collections to also increase. Hence, as far as possible, we need the nominal GDP as well as the real GDP to be very high. And in order to achieve, let's say, a $5 trillion economy, 
the real GDP as well as nominal GDP should also be very high. But in recent times, the nominal GDP growth rate as well as the real GDP growth rate both have uh, come down for Indian economy. As far as economic survey is concerned, growth for the financial year 20 in real GDP is estimated to be at 5% and the nominal GDP is estimated to be at 7.5%. Second, Fixed investment is estimated to be 28.1% of GDP, lower than 29.3%, which was for the year 2018 and 2019. Now, what is this concept of a fixed investment? You must have heard of the concept of a gross capital formation. Gross capital formation represents how much of these particular savings are done in a market will be converted into investments. I'll repeat the statement again. Gross capital formation basically represents how much of these particular savings which are done by the household, which are done by the firms or companies and which are done by the government will be converted into investment into market. And this particular investment could be in the form of a fixed investment, could be in the form of let's say construction of roads, construction of manufacturing facilities, so on and so forth. Or could be in the form of a manufacturing of inventories or stocks. So whenever any economy wants to achieve a higher GDP growth rate, you expect the capital formation of the economy should also increase or remain at a higher level. In case of India, the capital formation which was around 35 to 36 percent has kept on declining post 2011 and 2012 and economic survey states that the fixed investment component is estimated to be around 28% of GDP for the financial year 20, which is much much lesser than 29.3% for the year 2018 and 2019. That is the second very important point. Third one, the growth in the second half of current fiscal will witness an uptick over the first half of the current fiscal. Now, the economic survey makes this particular assessment based on certain observations. These particular observations are listed here. Let me begin with the first one. The stock market, which is basically the concept of uh, the BAC Sensex in case of India, the stock market or Sensex uh, has kept on increasing in the recent times. Although the GDP growth rate has been on a lower side or has been experiencing a slowdown in the Indian economy, the Sensex uh, has been a bit. The Sensex has been increasing. This basically means that uh, the investors in the domestic market are very much confident about the performance of Indian economy. Second, the foreign investors have continued to show their confidence on the Indian economy. And whenever I discuss the concept of a foreign investors, I am referring to FPI, Foreign Portfolio Investors or FDI, Foreign Direct Investment. The inflow of FPI as well as FDI has increased into the Indian market. There is a net inflow of both FPI as well as FDI, despite the Indian economy slowing down in the second quarter of the current fiscal. So these particular investors are very much confident about the growth prospects of Indian economy. Hence they are bringing their investments into the Indian market. Third one, the effect of previous rate cuts is showing in the increased demand. Now please understand, very recently the core inflation has increased. Now what do you mean by core inflation? We'll discuss it later. As of now simply understand this. The core inflation has increased, which means the market prices of certain commodities or basket of commodities has increased, which also means the demand for these particular basket of commodities has increased. Economic survey says this particular rise in the demand for this particular basket of commodities is because the earlier rate cuts which were introduced by the central banker or to be more precise the monetary policy committee had reduced the repo rates as well as SLR in the last couple of quarters. The impact of these particular reductions is being reflected in increased consumption demand for these particular goods and services in the market, which is being reflected in the form of increased core inflation. So I'll repeat the point again. The rate cuts have been introduced by the central banker. More money has been given in the hands of the consumers. Now the consumers are demanding more of these particular goods and services in the market. As a result of which, the market price have increased, core inflation has increased. Next one, industrial activity is on rebound reflected in the IP growth rates. IP basically stands for index of industrial production. The index of industrial production basically measures how much is a variation in the volume of output from one quarter to the next quarter or from one month to the next month. So basically this particular indicator is on a rebound or has been increasing. And this particular trend basically means the overall volume of production is increasing, which is a very good indicator 
to say that the growth will pick up in the second half of this particular fiscal. Next one, the merchandise exports are improving. The gross GST collection have registered a growth rate. Economic survey mentions that for the month of November as well as for the month of December, the GST collections have increased by 6% as well as 9% respectively. Now what is the connection between the GST as well as the GDP growth rate? Please understand, whenever we consume either goods or services in the market or purchase goods or services in the market, we pay an indirect tax to the government in the form of a GST. So if the GST collection increases, it means our consumption of goods and services also has increased. Again, there might be multiple reasons for increase in the GST. One of the reason is, if the consumption increases, the GST collection also increases. And since the GST collections have increased for the month of both November as well as December, the government or to be more precise, the economic survey says that there is an uptick of the consumption activity in the market, which means the production will also increase, which simply means there will be higher growth rate or the economy will be performing much better in the second half of the current fiscal compared to the first half of the current fiscal. Apart from this, there is a very important concept of a virtuous cycle of growth which is discussed. Now beyond this particular concept of virtuous cycle, they have discussed what is the impact of a change in the virtuous cycle on investment as well as consumption. We will go to that later. But before that, what do you mean by the concept of a virtuous cycle of a growth? Let me give an example. Imagine government of India infuses huge amount of money using the fiscal policy. Apart from government of India, even the central banker or RBI uses a lot of tools under the monetary policy. Using these particular tools, the money supply in the market has increased. Now when the money supply in the market increases, can I simply say that the interest rates in the market or cost of capital in the market will come down? When the cost of capital in the market will come down, we expect more companies to borrow from the banking sector. And when these particular companies will borrow, can I simply say that they will invest in let's say plant and machinery. In simple terms, more the loans issued to the companies, more will be the production which will take place. And when the production will increase, one of the natural outcomes will be employment will also increase. So on one side, the production of goods or services is increasing and on the other side, the incomes, salaries or wages of the consumers is also increasing. This will lead to higher aggregate demand in the market as well as a supply in the market. Ultimately, the outcome will be the GDP growth rates or the total production done in the economy will increase leading to higher GDP growth rate. So look at this. Once the infusion of liquidity is done in the market, we expect investment to increase, GDP to increase. This particular cycle that I am basically referring to is called as a virtuous cycle of growth. Now in case of Indian economy, economic survey states that whenever the virtuous cycle of a growth turns very slowly, that is, if there are certain restrictions with respect to money flow in the market, the investment will also come down or investment will get affected. And when the investment will get affected, the GDP growth rate will also get affected because it's a basic cycle. But there is a lag between the time period when the investment will come down to the time period when the GDP growth rate will come down. In simple terms, if I simply say that investment in the market is coming down today, GDP growth rate immediately will not come down today itself. There is a time gap between the time when the investment will come down to the time when the GDP growth rate will come down. As per economic survey, it has been found that in case of Indian economy, this particular time lag between the decline in the investment to the decline in the GDP growth rate is somewhere in the range of 3 to 4 years. Economic survey also states that the investment in the market started declining or coming down from the year 2011 and 2012. It has continued post 14 and 15 also. As a result of this, in the recent times, that is around 17 to 18, we have started experiencing the slowdown in the GDP growth rate. 
So this kind of a correlation exists between the investment as well as the GDP growth rate. Apart from this, there is also a problem with respect to the GDP growth rate as well as the consumption. That is, in case of virtuous cycle, we say that as GDP increases, it also means the consumption demand in the market also increases. And when GDP decreases, the natural outcome is the consumption should also decrease. But economic survey says there is a time lag. Again, there is a time gap between both of them. And the time lag that is applicable for Indian economy is around 1 to 2 years. So in recent times, in case of Indian economy, it has been experiencing a slowdown in the GDP growth rates. And the natural outcome of this has been that the consumption expenditure also has been declining. So these are the two points which have been discussed under the concept of a virtuous cycle of a growth. And finally, under this particular chapter, they have discussed what is the outlook for Indian economy in the next two financial years. For the financial year 20, and finally, under the concept of outlook, economic survey mentions what is the outlook for Indian economy in the current fiscal as well as in the next fiscal. And what could be the drivers or the parameters which will affect this particular growth rate. For the financial year 20, economic survey mentions GDP growth rate could be 5% and for financial year 21, GDP growth rate could be between 6% to 6.5%. Now there are certain factors which will affect either positively or negatively this particular growth rate that has been estimated by the economic survey. These have been listed under the concept of upside risk as well as the downside risk. Let me start with the upside risk in the first. In case of the global manufacturing, the economist has basically stating that yes, no doubt there is a slowdown which has been experienced by the global economy. As already mentioned in the world economic outlook, the global growth rate was at around 3.8% for the year 2017 and by 2019 has a decline to 2.9 percent having said so there's a term called as a bottoming out what do you mean by bottoming out the production will keep on declining up to certain level and after reaching the lowest level of production possible during this particular period of time the production will be revived in simple terms the growth rate will be revived this has been mentioned in the world economic outlook itself which says that for the current fiscal, we are expecting a global growth rate of 3.3%, which means the global manufacturing has a bottom out. We are expecting a revival in the coming fiscal. Sir. That is the first one. Second, various countries, especially government of India, is focusing again on boosting exports. For example, government of India extended the MEIS scheme till the end of the 31st March or the till the end of the current fiscal which means they are focused on boosting exports. Apart from this, Government of India also has taken various initiatives to promote more and more exports. Third one, promotion of affordable housing. Very recently, a lot of initiatives have been taken in order to promote more and more consumption of real estate. One of the very important initiatives that was taken was by the GST Council where they reduced the GST rate on affordable housing segment to 1%. Now this particular reform is expected to increase the consumption of real estate. Real estate sector is very important for a simple reason. It contributes to the GDP. It generates huge amount of employment. And in recent times, real estate sector has come under a lot of stress, which is also one of the reason why there is a slowdown in the domestic market. Next, global sentiment is in favor of India. This has been represented in the form of a net inflow of both FPI as well as FDI which have become stronger in the recent times or in the recent months itself which means the global investors are very confident about the growth prospects of Indian market. Next, the government has reduced the corporate tax rate. On the existing companies, the corporate tax rate has been reduced from 30% to 22%. On, on the new manufacturing companies which will be set up after a particular date, the corporate income tax rate has been reduced to 15%. This is expected to boost the investments into the manufacturing. This is expected to boost a lot of creation of employment opportunities. And more importantly, this is expected to contribute in the form of higher manufacturing activity to GDP. Next, merger of PSPs. Government of India has announced merging 10 PSPs and forming 4 larger PSPs. The concept of having a larger PSP or a larger bank or a bigger bank is that 
these particular bigger banks will be efficient in terms of managing their resources, will be able to utilize their size or the size of the balance sheet to lend for infrastructure activity or to lend for bigger number of projects or larger projects in the domestic market. So this is another way of promoting more and more credit offtake into these particular sectors. So these are some of the reasons citing which the economic survey has stated that the growth rate is expected to be reviving. Apart from this, it has also cited certain concerns which are in the form of a downside risk. First and foremost, the trade tensions have increased in the recent years. And as the trade tensions increase, the prospects of a recovery of a GDP will also keep on declining. For example, very recently, the administration of USA has imposed tariffs on many of the exports from India. India is also in retaliation has imposed tariffs on US exports to India. US administration has withdrawn the GSP benefits. US administration has announced that India will be taken out of the list of developing countries. And as a result of this particular measure, Indian exports will be losing certain exemptions which they would otherwise have obtained from the US. So the trade tensions have increased. I have only mentioned the trade tensions which are existing between India and USA. There are trade tensions between India and China, trade tensions between USA and China, trade tensions between various trading partners. And as long as these particular trade tensions will not come down, the prospects of recovery will be at risk. Second one, added to trade tension, there is also geopolitical tension. Now some of you will have this particular doubt. What is the impact of geopolitical tension on Indian economy? I'll give a very simple example. Whenever the geopolitical tension in the form of, uh, let's say, US sanctions on Middle East will keep on increasing, there is a certain impact on the Indian economy. This particular impact will be felt in a simple form of uh, crude oil imports. Although there are various issues, I'll focus on one point here. Crude oil imports. India imports more than 80% of its requirement from the international market. And whenever the geopolitical tensions will increase, the crude oil prices in the international market will also keep on increasing. And whenever the crude oil prices will increase, the import bill of crude will also keep on increasing. And when the import bill of crude oil will increase, the deficit in the form of current account deficit will increase for India. Not only this, it has been observed that whenever crude oil prices will increase, the fiscal deficit of government of India will also increase. So there are large scale repercussions of this geopolitical tensions on the Indian growth prospect. Next, ineffective monetary policies. In majority of the countries, the central bankers are shifting to unconventional monetary policies. For example, there was a discussion on negative interest rates which have been introduced by some of these particular central bankers. These kinds of unconventional monetary policy tools are being used for a simple reason. The conventional monetary policy tools are becoming ineffective in these particular economies. In the context of Indian economy itself, let me give an example. Very recently, the Central Banker of India, that is Reserve Bank of India, conducted an operation called as Operation Twist. Under this particular concept of Operation Twist, the objective of Central Banker was to ensure that the credit offtake of the banking sector will increase. And this particular concept of operation twist was conducted for the first time in case of Indian monetary policy. The point here is that although the central bankers have these kind of a traditional tools of monetary policy which they have used to adjust the credit flow in the market, these kind of conventional tools are becoming ineffective in the present context. Hence, more and more central bankers are opting for unconventional monetary policies. Last point, increased public sector investment. Please understand, if government of India borrows heavily from the domestic market and invests in the market, this is basically referred to as public sector investment. But the concern is, under this particular concept, government of India aims to have a total investment of 102 lakh crore rupees from private sector as well as state government as well as the central government itself. But the concern is this, if central government wants to invest around 39% in this particular national infrastructure pipeline, it will be forced to borrow from the domestic market. The problem with this kind of a borrowing is, one, when government of India will borrow heavily from the domestic market, it will lead to increase in the interest rates in the market. Second, as the interest rates will increase, it will negatively affect the borrowings of the private sector. 
and there is a crowding out effect which is observed because of this. And third, when government of India borrows heavily from the domestic market, fiscal deficit of government of India will increase. And on the other side, if private sector borrows from the international market, the debt service payment will be very high. And when the debt service payments is very very high, the current account deficit is expected to expand. So these are the points which have been discussed in the first chapter of Economic Survey Volume 2.